I don't think we've seen anyone dunk with that type of force, animosity, you know, just like, like oh! you know, just like. <laughs> <laughs> His highlight reel can stack up against anyone's. A big man that came into the league during an era dominated by big men. But it was the way he played that was different from all of them. At a time where the big man dominated down low through elite post play and great footwork, Sean Kemp used his otherworldly athleticism to run the floor like a guard and soar over defenders. One of the best jumpers of all time, Kemp knew how to use his athleticism for huge dunks, but also to outjump defenders as one of the best offensive rebounders of his generation. He and Gary Payton formed a duo that resulted in the most entertaining era of Sonics basketball ever. His first eight years in the league were incredible, and it seemed like he was only going to get better. But at the peak of his career, contract disputes and a bigger struggle with addiction forced him out of Seattle. In Cleveland, he was still effective, but he was no longer the same player that fans had grown to love, as his addiction spiraled and his fitness became a big issue. By the time he was 30, he had been reduced to a role player, and by the time he was 33, he was out of the league. But even though his career went on a rapid and steep decline, Sean Kemp personified 90s basketball and showed the league that there are more ways for a big man to be effective. The Rain Man has become overlooked as time has passed, but there was a time when he was one of the biggest mismatches in the NBA. And that's why he's the topic of today's episode. Let's jog your memory. An Indiana native, Sean Kemp was a local star for Concord High School. Kemp was a four-year starter for the Minutemen, where in 1988, he would lead the team to a 28-0 record and an appearance in the state title game. As a junior in 87, he was a parade second-team All-American and a parade first-team All-American as a senior in 88 as well as a McDonald's All-American, as part of a stacked class which included guys like Alonzo Mourning, Mahmoud abdul Rauf, and Christian Leitner. Concord was must-see basketball because of Kemp and his above-the-rim play, so much so that coaches would reroute their scouting trips just to catch a Minutemen game. By the time his high school career was over, he was Concord's career scoring leader with over 2,100 points. Kemp would commit to play for the Kentucky Wildcats, and reportedly during summer pickup games with big-name Kentucky alum, Kemp was taking it to them without any fear, but he never got a chance to suit up for the Wildcats after failing to obtain the minimum score of 700 on his SATs, so Kemp had to sit out his freshman year. And unfortunately during this time, he was accused of pawning some stolen jewelry, which belonged to one of his teammates. But it is worth mentioning that the teammate in question, Sean Sutton, would later say that even though Kemp had tried to pawn it, he was not the one who stole it. And Kemp's high school coach would also later say that Kemp being in a basketball environment without being able to play was the worst thing for him, and even thought to advise Kemp to enter the NBA draft, but was hesitant due to it being so uncommon at the time. Kemp would transfer to Trinity Valley Community College instead, but would only spend a semester there, again never suiting up for the team. And it was after what would have been his freshman season that he ultimately decided to declare for the 1989 NBA draft. So even though Kemp hadn't played a college game, there was a reason he was one of the most highly touted prospects in the nation, so the Supersonics had no problem making him a first round selection when they took him with the 17th pick. Kemp would join a Seattle team in a bit of a transition period. They had recently made a conference finals appearance, featuring a great trio, but Tom Chambers had recently left in free agency, and the remaining members of Xavier McDaniel and Dale Ellis would have their own conflicts soon enough, but for the time being, Kemp was coming into a team with a wealth of more than capable forwards but the youngest player in the NBA was still able to get respectable playing time. Although Kemp was just a rotation player, he would appear in 81 games, starting one of them, while even managing a 20-point game versus San Antonio on March 20th. And one of his main weapons throughout his career was his ability to utilize his supreme athleticism on the offensive glass, as in less than 14 minutes per game, he averaged nearly two offensive boards. His athleticism was also on display on a nightly basis through his ability to run the floor and dunk on everybody and anybody as his highlight reel slams would get him a spot in the slam dunk contest. But McDaniel missed 13 games, and Ellis also missed significant time after a car accident. And because of this, the Sonics were only able to manage a 41-41 record, which wouldn't be enough for a playoff berth. And Kemp's rookie year saw him average about 6.5 points, 4 rebounds, and a block per game. Going into 91, the Sonics had added the second piece to what would become one of the best duos in the 90s by drafting Oregon State point guard Gary Payton. Additionally, tensions between McDaniel and Ellis would boil over early in the year, resulting in both players being traded away before season's end. But luckily for Kemp, this would thrust him into a much larger role, and he would respond. Kemp would again play in 81 games, becoming a starter in early December, 
as he would up his scoring by over 8 points per game and become the team's best rebounder while finishing second on the team in blocks per game, which would include his career high of 10 blocks in a January 18th loss to the Lakers. Kemp would now hit double figures in 61 games while also recording 27 double-doubles, and he was doing it very efficiently as he was shooting nearly 51%. Kemp would again find himself in the dunk contest where he would finish as a runner-up to Celtics rookie D. Brown. But another problem that plagued Kemp throughout his career would really be on display with him as a starter, as his 319 personal fouls would be the third highest in the NBA. The Sonics would finish with an identical record from last year, but this time it was enough for the 8th seed to get them a first round matchup with Portland. And even though Portland was the heavy favorite, Seattle would push them the distance, as the series went 5 games with the Blazers moving on. However, it was the Seattle veterans who were mostly responsible for this. Kemp struggled, as his averages were down across the board, and he would shoot below 39% for the series. But he would still record one double-double in Game 2, and put up 17 points on 6 of 9 shooting in the series deciding Game 5. But for the regular season, Kemp would average about 15 points, 8.5 rebounds, 1 steal, and a block and a half per game. Going into 92, the Sonics were beginning to build something. They would get full seasons from Ricky Pierce and Eddie Johnson, who had been acquired through the Ellis and McDaniel trades and after going through three coaches, would settle on George Carl about halfway through the year. But they were without Kemp for the first month of the year with an ankle injury. Additionally, after the hiring of George Carl on January 23rd, he would elect to bring Kemp off the bench for the rest of the season, as Kemp would only start 23 of the 64 games he played. Kemp's scoring remained basically the same, and was good for third on the team. But his rebounding and block numbers continued to improve, as he led the team in both categories, averaging double-digit rebounds and nearly two blocks per game and for the third straight year, he would be a dunk contest participant. The Sonics had a mediocre start to the year as they were 20 and 20 before the Carl hiring. But after this, they would go 27 and 15, which would again earn them a playoff berth, this time versus Golden State. And this series would be Kemp's coming out party. As a starter, Kemp began the series with 28 and 16 in a game one win, then would have 17 and 19 in a game two loss. A game three win would see him put up 22 and 10, and the Sonics would close out the Warriors in Game 4, with Kemp putting up an insane stat line of 21 points, 20 rebounds, and 5 blocks. But obviously, this series is remembered for the Lister blister. In Game 2, Kemp and Alton Lister would get into a dust-up, with Lister throwing some punches at Kemp. And clearly, Kemp didn't forget this, as in Game 4, he caught a pass at the top of the key, and famously threw down one of the nastiest posters of all time, followed by him taunting Lister afterwards. And now the Sonics were moving on to play Utah in round two. This series would not go as well, as the Jazz made quick work of Seattle with the gentleman's sweep. Kemp looked to be picking up where he left off with 19 and 15 in game one, then 20 and 9 in game two, but the Jazz would still win both. The Sonics would win game three before losing the next two, as Kemp would only average 10 points and 7 rebounds across the final three games. And for the regular season, Kemp put up about 15 and a half points, 10 and a half rebounds, one steal, and two blocks per game. Going into 1993, it was clear that Kemp and Peyton were two of the league's brightest young stars. These two, along with Ricky Pierce, would be the Sonics' best scorers, with Kemp again finishing as their best rebounder and shot blocker. But again, Kemp's 327 personal fouls would be second in the league. With their new young duo and a balanced scoring attack, the Sonics would finish as a top 5 scoring offense in the league. Kemp would record 75 games in double figures, as well as 45 double-doubles and would even have a 20-20 game on November 6th versus Houston, when he put up 29 points and 20 rebounds in a win, as he would receive the first All-Star selection of his career. Additionally, with Kemp averaging a steal and a half and nearly two blocks, alongside the elite defensive backcourt of Peyton and Nate McMillan, the Sonics also boasted a top five scoring defense, and they were able to ride this to a 55-27 record, as they would also record a 10-game win streak in the middle of the year. They would also make a move on February 2nd to further improve the team, as they acquired big man Sam Perkins in a trade with the Lakers. The Sonics would start the playoffs in a rematch with Utah, but this time it would end in Seattle's favor. Kemp would lead the team in scoring this series, but would do so on less than 15 points per game, albeit an efficient 15 points, but the Sonics had a balanced attack with six players averaging double figures. Kemp would have an incredible game one with 29 and 17 on nearly 59% shooting, but wouldn't be able to replicate these numbers the rest of the way. Nonetheless, the Sonics won in 5 and advanced to play Houston in round 2. This series would again go the distance, with Seattle winning in 7. But Kemp really struggled versus the defense of Hakeem Olajuwon, as although he averaged a double-double, he would shoot below 42%. He would record 4 double-doubles and 3 games with at least 18 points, 
but he would also have two games with less than 10 points and shoot over 47% just once. But Seattle survived and were moving on to their first conference finals since 87, where they would take on a new look Suns team featuring MVP Charles Barkley. This would be yet another series to go the distance for Seattle, but they couldn't keep the magic going and would lose to Phoenix. But Kemp would have his best series of the playoffs, as he and Barkley had a memorable duel. Kemp would average over 20 points and 9 rebounds, while also averaging nearly 3.5 blocks per game. He would have at least 16 points in every game, including his postseason career high of 33 on 13 of 18 shooting in Game 5. But he would also have 5 fouls in 5 of the games, and would foul out of 2 of them, including the deciding Game 7, as the Sonics' dream season would come to an end. But for the regular season, Kemp would average about 18 points, 10.5 rebounds, 1.5 steals, and 2 blocks per game. During the offseason, Kemp and the Sonics would dodge a bullet after Kemp was sent to the hospital during a commercial shoot for Reebok when the rim broke during a dunk resulting in Kemp crashing to the floor. Luckily, he was released from the hospital hours later with no serious injuries. So the 94 Sonics had made a lot of changes in the offseason. Eddie Johnson was included in a trade that would see the Sonics receive young swingman Kendall Gill from the Hornets. Additionally, days before the start of the year, the Sonics would acquire former sixth man of the year, Detlef Schrempf from Indiana. So now they had a new supporting cast for their star duo, who were clearly the focal point of the team at this point. The duo would be the team's top two scorers, with Kemp again acting as their best rebounder and shot blocker, in what was another step forward for the fifth year star. Kemp would record double figures in 76 of the 79 games he played, while having 32 games with at least 20. He would have 47 double doubles and his first career triple double in a March 20th win versus Charlotte. Additionally, his 312 offensive rebounds would be sixth in the league. His 2.1 blocks per game would be a career high, as he would have 19 games with at least 4 blocks, while finishing 10th in the league in blocks per game. And his overall defense would see him secure the 4th lowest defensive rating in the league. And all of this combined would see him finish 7th in MVP voting, one spot behind teammate Gary Payton. However, Kemp would also finish the year with a league-leading 312 personal fouls. Come All-Star weekend, Kemp was again an All-Star, and would participate in his final dunk contest. And by season's end, he would see himself voted second team All-NBA. And the Sonics were playing great, as they started the year 10-0, and would never record more than a three-game losing streak this season. As by the end of the year, they had the league's best record at 63-19, and, and looked poised to this time make it out of the West. But that's not what happened. The top-seeded Sonics were facing the heavy underdog Denver Nuggets in Round 1. Kemp would struggle at times versus the Nuggets defense led by center Dikembe Mutombo, but the series seemed to be going as expected, as a Game 1 blowout win saw Kemp put up 16-9. Then another double-digit win in Game 2 saw Kemp put up 13-12 with 4 blocks. Game 3 would be an easy win for Denver, with Kemp putting up just 10 points on 3 of 11 shooting. But then in Game 4, the Nuggets shockingly tied the series. However, Kemp did play better with 16-13. But then in Game 5, the Nuggets shocked the world not only coming back from a 2-0 deficit, but also becoming the first 8 seed to defeat a 1 seed, as Kemp put up 19-12 and 12 in Game 5. So the Sonics year ended with Kemp averaging about 18 points, 11 rebounds, 2 steals, and 2 blocks per game. Going into 95, Kemp had a contract extension, but also had reportedly put on about 20 pounds to better handle the physicality of the NBA's best big men, and it paid off. But first, Kemp would make a summer pit stop in Toronto, playing for Dream Team 2 at the 94 FIBA World Championships, where he would average about 9.5 points and 7 rebounds across the 8 games, including 14-9 and nine in the gold medal game versus Russia, which the US would win easily. Although Kemp would have his highest scoring average of his career up to this point, he fell to third on the team in scoring, but shot nearly 55% from the field, while again leading the team in rebounds and blocks. His 316 offensive rebounds would be top 5 in the league, and his overall defensive ability was again on display, as he would have one of the 10 lowest defensive ratings in the NBA. But he would have a career-high 337 personal fouls, which would be the league's second highest total. Throughout the season, Kemp would hit double figures in 78 games, including his career-high in a December 10th win versus the Clippers, when he went for 42 points on 11 of 16 shooting and 20 of 22 from the free throw line. Additionally, he would have 48 double-doubles, as he would once again be voted to the All-Star Game and be named second team All-NBA. The Sonics were again a dominant team, with a top 3 scoring offense. However, their scoring defense had dropped to 15th. Nonetheless, this was still good for a 55-27 record and the 4 seed, but the postseason would end in another first round exit, this time at the hands of the Lakers. However, Kemp would have an incredible series, averaging nearly 25 points and 12 rebounds on about 58% shooting, as he would record at least 21 points in each game and 3 double-doubles. 
the Sonics would begin the series with a blowout win, but they would then lose the next three by a combined 10 points. Even though Kemp closed out the series strong with 30 and 11 in Game 3, then 26 points, 18 rebounds, 4 steals, and 4 blocks in Game 4. But for the regular season, Kemp would put up about 18 and a half points, 11 rebounds, and a block and a half per game. Going into 96, the Sonics had rebranded and made an off-season trade, which saw them send shooting guard Kendall Gill to the Hornets for shooting guard Hersey Hawkins, who would end up being a perfect fit in Seattle. Kemp would re-establish himself as the team's top scorer, as he and Peyton were at the peak of their partnership. This season, along with a then career high scoring average, Kemp averaged a career high in rebounds, as his 11.4 would be top 5 in the league. His career high shooting percentage of 56.1% would also be top 5 in the league, and his offensive rebounds dropped to 276, but that was still 6th most in the league. And his elite defensive impact remained as well, as he had the second lowest defensive rating in the league. Kemp would again be voted an All-Star and received his final second team All-NBA selection, as overall he would finish 8th in MVP voting. Kemp would put up double figures in 75 games while recording 47 double-doubles, including his career high of 22 rebounds to go along with 17 points in a December 12th loss to Dallas. The Sonics were again among the NBA's elite, with a top 10 scoring defense and the second highest scoring offense in the league, which was largely due to their high speed offense, which ran at the third highest pace in the league. They wouldn't lose a game from February 3rd to March 5th, as they put together a 14 game win streak and would have another nine game win streak later in the year to finish with the best record in the West at 64 and 18. And after two disappointing playoff exits, they would put together the franchise's best postseason run in nearly 20 years. The first round would bring the Sacramento Kings, but Kemp would miss game one as he was serving a suspension for fighting in the regular season finale. Nonetheless, it was an easy win for the Sonics. Kemp came back with 21 in game two, but would also have nine turnovers as the Kings surprisingly evened the series and gave the Sonics flashbacks of the past two years. But Seattle would win the next two, with Kemp averaging 15 points and 8.5 rebounds across games 3 and 4, as the Sonics advanced past the first round for the first time since 93. Round 2 brought the Houston Rockets, and Kemp would play well in a 4 game sweep of Houston. He would record double doubles in each game, but his shooting would be up and down. He would shoot over 63% in games 1 and 4, but below 39% in games 2 and 3. But he would save his best game for last as he had a game-high 32 to go along with 15 rebounds and 3 blocks in the series clinching Game 4, as the Sonics were heading back to the conference finals to face the Utah Jazz. This series would be a battle. Even though Seattle went up 3 games to 1, Utah would survive to force a Game 6, then blow out the Sonics to set up a Game 7 in Seattle. Kemp was incredibly efficient this series, shooting 69% from the field over the 7 games, which included 21 points on 10 of 11 shooting in Game 1. He would also average nearly 24 points and 14 rebounds across games 5 through 7, including a game high 26 and 14 on over 66% shooting in the series deciding game 7, as the Sonics were heading to the NBA Finals for the first time since 1979. However, waiting for them would be the 72 and 10 Chicago Bulls. The Sonics would come out flat and had many of their top players producing below their season averages, but the Sonics duo came to play, and Kemp especially showed no quit. He would put up a game high 32 in game 1, then would put up 29 and 13 with 5 blocks in game 2. But the Bulls would win both, and now Seattle was in a 2 0 hole. They would hope to regain momentum returning home for game 3, but Kemp would only take 7 shots and score 14 points, as the Bulls blew them out and were now one win away from the championship. Kemp wouldn't lay down though, as in game 4, he put up 25 and 11 on over 70% shooting to keep the Sonics alive. Then they would make it a series with a game 5 win as Kemp had 22 and 10 in 46 minutes of action. But the Bulls ended the comeback with the game six win in Chicago, as Kemp had 18 and 14. And for the regular season, Kemp averaged about 19 and a half points, 11 and a half rebounds, and one and a half blocks per game. There was no reason to believe the Sonics wouldn't be back, with a 28 year old Peyton and a 27 year old Kemp going into the 97 season. But Kemp wasn't happy with the Sonics. He had skipped out on training camp as he was upset with his current contract. Reportedly, he was also upset with some of the other Sonic signings like Jim McElveen, who had received a large contract that exceeded Kemp's salary. Kemp felt he was worth the big money after what he had done for the franchise, but there was also complications with his previous extension signed a few years earlier and the league's current CBA, preventing him from making any changes to the contract until the following offseason. So Kemp was unhappy going into the 97 regular season. For the most part, he put up similar numbers to what he had been doing as he again averaged a double-double as the team's second leading scorer and top rebounder. But he had dropped to only a single block per game. 
he would still have 72 games in double figures and 44 double doubles, and again have a top 10 defensive rating, as he would make his fifth straight all-star appearance. But as the season progressed, Kemp's play regressed. As the year went on, Kemp was reportedly showing less commitment to the team and was often late. Then near the end of the season, in April, reports came out that it was more than just a down year for Kemp. According to sources, uh, last Saturday, immediately following the Sonics' win over the Mavericks, and it was uh, Sean Kemp played terribly in that game again. The previous day, he had missed practice again. So immediately after that win, Gary Payton called a players-only meeting and asked Sean Kemp to tell the team what was going on in his life. And at that meeting, say sources, he admitted to the team that he was having difficulty with drinking. So now, with the Sonics hoping to make another finals run, one of their biggest stars was struggling and not performing at nearly the level they needed him to. He would finish the season strong, notching at least 22 points in four of his last five regular season games, as the 57-25 Sonics entered the playoffs with a matchup against Phoenix. And although Kemp's efficiency was lower than usual in this series, he still produced more like fans were used to. He would average over 22 points and 14 rebounds in a five-game series win, as he had double figures in each game and would even put up 24 points and 20 rebounds in a Game 4 win. The Sonics would move on to face Houston in Round 2, but this is where their season came to an end. Seattle would fall behind 3 games to 1, but would come back to push the series to a 7th game. Kemp would again play well, averaging 21-11 on nearly 50% shooting. But it just wasn't enough, and for the regular season, Kemp averaged about 18.5 points, 10 rebounds, and a block per game. If there was any hope that the relationship between Kemp and the Sonics could be salvaged, that was gone when Kemp demanded a trade shortly after the year. Then a couple months later, he got his wish, as he was part of a blockbuster trade that saw three All-Stars change homes, with Kemp ending up in Cleveland with a new seven-year contract worth about $100 million. But this would be the beginning of Kemp's downfall. Kemp was the clear star on a Cavaliers team with solid role players, but nowhere near the overall talent that his Sonics teams had. And in Cleveland, Kemp would assume a different role as the team's go-to guy. He would operate much more out of the half court as the Cavs played at a much slower pace. Kemp shot the lowest field goal percentage of his career up to this point, due to operating more in the post and overall taking the most shots he would ever take in his career. But he continued to look like one of the top players in the league. He would lead the team in scoring and rebounding while still putting up over a block per game. He would have 73 games in double figures and 41 double doubles, including a 31 point, 20 rebound game versus Portland on January 20th. Additionally, he would still have one of the lowest defensive ratings in the league, as he was voted to his sixth and final All-Star game. He wasn't experiencing the same team success as he had in Seattle, but the Cavs still went 47-35 and, and would get a first round playoff matchup with Indiana. The more complete Pacers would be too much for Cleveland, but Kemp still played great, as he led all scorers in every game. He would have 25-13 and in Game 1, then follow that up with 27-9 and in Game 2. But the Cavs were down 2-0 and needed a big performance from Kemp to stay alive, which he gave them, as he put up 31 in a Game 3 win to keep them alive. But he played his worst game in Game 4, with 21 on 6 of 16 shooting, as the Pacers closed it out. And for the regular season, Kemp averaged about 18 points, 9.5 rebounds, and a block per game. The lockout occurred during the summer, which gave players a lot more time off leading up to the 99 season, which probably wasn't good for Kemp. His listed playing weight this year was 280 pounds, already about 35 pounds up from the season prior. But reports later surfaced that he had come to training camp much heavier than that, possibly around 315 pounds. And you could tell he was heavier by looking at him, but also by watching him play, as he seemed to have lost some quickness and athleticism, as you were seeing more mid-range shots and less above the rim play from Kemp this year. But even though he had put on weight, he was putting together one of the best offensive seasons of his career. He would average a career-high 20.5 points per game and still was the team's leading rebounder at over 9 per game, while averaging a steal and a block. Kemp would still hit double figures in every game he played and record 20 double-doubles, but his overall defense had taken a hit, and the Cavs as a whole had regressed, in large part due to centers Adrunas Silgauskas only playing 5 games this year, as they would go 22-28 and, and miss the playoffs. And for the regular season, Kemp put up about 20.5 points, 9 rebounds, 1 steal, and a block per game. Kemp was back with the Cavs for the 2000 season, but there had been no change in his weight, and it's quite likely that this was due to a growing alcohol and possibly cocaine addiction. Nonetheless, Kemp would surprisingly play and start in all 82 games for the only time in his career. His production remained similar, as although his numbers were dropping, 
he would again be the team's leading scorer and rebounder. But his trademark efficiency was gone, as he shot below 42% on the year. He would still hit double figures in 78 games and record 35 double-doubles. But this clearly wasn't the same Kemp, as he averaged about 5 less minutes per game than the year before, and the Cavs went 32-50 and 50 and missed the playoffs. And for the regular season, Kemp averaged about 18 points, 9 rebounds, 1 steal, and a block per game. During the offseason, Kemp was involved in a trade which saw him sent to the Portland Trailblazers, who were coming off of two straight conference finals appearances and looking for more veteran help. But this proved to be a bad trade for Portland, as addiction had turned Kemp into a shell of his former self. Kemp would join a deep Blazers team, where he would be nothing more than a rotation player, putting up career lows across the board. His weight had ballooned, and while he had some good moments this year, he also had some terrible games. The Blazers were still on their way to another 50-win season, but were prepping for the playoffs when reports came out in early April that Kemp would be checking himself into rehab for his cocaine addiction, and would miss the remainder of the year and the postseason. With Kemp in rehab, the Blazers took on the Lakers in round one, but would be swept. And Kemp's regular season ended with him averaging about 6.5 points and 4 rebounds per game. Kemp was back with the Blazers for 0-2 and would again find himself with a similar role in the rotation, as he would put up similar numbers. He would play 75 games this year and have some vintage moments, like a 21-point, 14-rebound performance versus Washington on March 16th. But he was just another role player on a deep team at this point. However, the Blazers would go 49-33 and, and again make the playoffs, where they would face the Lakers again, and this time Kemp would be playing in the postseason. However, he would have a limited role with his best game coming in Game 2, when he had 7 points and a steal, as the Blazers were again swept. And for the regular season, Kemp averaged about 6 points and 4 rebounds per game. Kemp was a free agent after this year, and would sign with the Orlando Magic shortly before the start of the 03 season, as he would join the Magic duo of Tracy McGrady and Grant Hill. Unfortunately, injuries would limit Hill to just 29 games this year, but Kemp would play his largest role since his time in Cleveland, as he appeared in 79 games and would start 55 of them as the team's center. He would get more minutes and would respond with slightly better production than in Portland, but he still wasn't a focal point of an offense led by McGrady. But the Magic would still go 42-40 and, and get a first round matchup with Detroit, and it was looking good for Orlando, as they went up 3-1, but would collapse and lose the next three to lose the series. Kemp came off the bench all series to average about 3 points and 2 rebounds, and for the regular season, Kemp averaged about 7 points, 5.5 rebounds, and a steal per game. But at 33 years old, that would be the end of Sean Kemp's career. His name was thrown around in some comeback attempts in the mid-2000s, but nothing ever materialized, and it didn't help that he was still struggling with drugs and getting into trouble with the law, with the most recent coming in 2023. But Sean Kemp's time in the NBA began better than you could ask for. He was a new breed of power forward that had the quickness and athleticism to keep up with guards and dominate bigger forwards, but the size to create mismatches for the smaller, quicker players tasked with guarding him. His first eight years in the league were dominant, and he was one of the best and most exciting players during the 90s. But his struggles with addiction and the extended offseason due to the 99 lockout were his downfall. Although he had some good years in Cleveland, he was no longer the Sean Kemp fans had grown accustomed to and the last few years of his career were spent in unfamiliar territory as a bench player. But Sean Kemp was one of the first to go from high school to the NBA and help blaze the trail for a new generation of big men. Never the top player at his position, he's found himself flying under the radar of the conversation of great big men as the years have gone on. But in his prime, Sean Kemp was a force on the offensive and defensive end. He wasn't just a good player, he was a popular player. The type of guy whose highlights you'd show to someone who had never watched basketball to show them how exciting the game could be. And even though his career is so much more than the highlights, his highlight reel is one of the best in all of sports. But that's it for today's episode on the Rain Man, Sean Kemp. Hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his early Supersonics teammates, or this one on one of the players involved in the trade that sent him to Cleveland. Thanks for watching, and see you next time.